I've always loved baseball. I loved baseball from the time I was a child, and so I was so excited when I got to play Little League for the very first time. And I still remember to this day, the entry fee for Little League was $20. And every family had a choice. They could either pay the $20 or they could sell candy bars. And to me, that's a no-brainer. I'm like, Mom, I want to sell candy bars. She's like, are you sure? Because we'll just pay the fee. I'm like, no, Mom, I want to sell candy bars. Because what I really wanted was to eat 20 candy bars. Because you got 20 candy bars, and you had to sell them all for a dollar. And so my plan was to sell candy bars, but to eat all the candy bars, and then just my, my parents pay the $20 anyways. So everybody wins. Because at the end of the day, you're getting added benefit for the $20. What point is there in just cutting the check when you can get 20 candy bars as well? Well, two candy bars in, my mom cut me off. She's like, you're done. I'm like, what do you mean I'm done? I've got 18 more to eat. She's like, no, you have 18 more to go sell. Now, I grew up in a simpler time. I grew up in a time where kids could actually go out to play without their parents having to watch them every single second and wrap them in bubble wrap or have to worry constantly about somebody calling the police because your kids are playing by themselves in the backyard. I grew up in a very simple time. And so I went to the first door with my box of candy bars, and I rang the doorbell. And I heard a dog barking. <laughs> I'm like, nope, I'm out. So I went to the second house, and I rang the doorbell. And somebody answered. He said, would you like to buy a candy bar? I said, no. I'm like, all right. Went to a third house, rang the doorbell. What do you want? I'm like, would you like to buy a candy bar? I work the night shift. You just woke me up. I'm like seven. I don't know. I'm just trying to sell candy bars. Sorry. Don't walk through the grass on the way to the next house. Have a good day, Grumpy. Sounds good. Went to the fourth house. Candy bar. No. All right. This is going to be a little harder than I thought. Went to the fifth house. Rang the door. A teenager answered. I'm like, yes, because if there's anything I know about teenagers, they love to eat. I'm like, would you like a candy bar? He's like, yeah. I'm like, that'll be a dollar. He's like, I don't have any money, which is when I learned the second thing I know about teenagers. <laughs> they love to eat, and they don't ever have any money. It's always like, and that doesn't end for some people ever, and for most of us till you're halfway through your 20s, all right? But he said, but I, I can't buy a candy bar, but let me help you with something. I'm like, all right, I don't have anything but time and a box full of candy bars at this point in my life. Teach me, sensei. He said, when you go up to the door, give him a sales pitch. I'm like, what? He's like, here's what you need to do. Ring the doorbell. When they answer the door, adjust your cap a little bit. Tell them, hi, my name is Brian. And I just want to play baseball. Would you be willing to support green sports and youth baseball by buying a candy bar? A rich, delicious chocolate bar for just one dollar? He's like, try that, see what happens. I'm like, okay. Walk to the next house, ring the doorbell. Would you like to buy a candy bar? <laughs> I said, no. So I went to the next house. I'm like, why not? rang the doorbell, answered the door. I looked at him and said, how would you like to support the youth of America and baseball efforts everywhere, all while enjoying a candy bar at the same time for the low, low price of $1? They said, I'll take five. I was floored. I only had 13 more to sell. Now, I don't, I'm not sure I could do that math at that point, but I knew my box was less heavy, and that was awesome. And then I went to the next place, and I sold two more. And then I went to a construction zone because they were building a new house in the lot next to that. And I gave the foreman my spiel. He opened his wallet. He said, oh, I don't have any money. Hang on. He stopped four other builders until they had enough money to buy every candy bar that I had left in my box, and I was sold out, and I was so excited because I could go home and sit in air conditioning on a summer day. It was fantastic. 
All because somebody took the time to say, this is what you need to do. If I would have kept going through the neighborhood just asking everybody, would you like a candy bar? I still would probably have old stale candy bars sitting somewhere around my house to this day. Because my mom was, she was very stern. You're cut off after two. All right? So I had 18 more bars. And it was somebody who took the time to give me a guide and say, hey, this is what you need to do. This is the approach that you need to take. What's incredible that we're going to see this morning is that for something that so many of us struggle with, this idea and this concept of prayer, somebody took the time to give us a guide to make it easier, to make it more effective. And oh, by the way, the person who did this is Jesus. He gives us a guide and tells us literally what we need to do and how we need to pray. If you're just joining us for the first time or you're joining us for the first time in a few weeks, we're so glad that you're here. Welcome to Lakeside. My name is Brian and I'm part of the team. Thanks for spending part of your day with us. We've been looking at prayer for the last couple weeks. And two weeks ago when we started our look at prayer, what we saw is that we need to be persistent. In all of life, persistence pays off and it's no different in prayer, that we need to be people who are persistent in our prayer. And what we saw last week was we saw how not to pray. Jesus told people how not to pray, and he said really to forget what most of us know about prayer. He said, you don't need to make a show of it. You don't need to try to use some religious vocabulary. He said, be yourself. Make this an intimate experience between you and in God. And so much of, of what happens when our prayer lives get stifled is we go back to, to this attempt to, to be religious in what we say, or, or we, try to, we try to find key words that the God, will, God will listen to more if we throw them out there. And you know how I know this? Here's how I know this, because I'm guilty of it in my own life. And here's the telltale sign of how you're guilty of this. When you're praying about something you don't really care about. You ever been bored in prayer? You know why? Because you don't really care. You don't really care. If it's something that you're passionate about and something that you really care about, you don't, you don't have to fight boredom. But when we try to fit God in a box and we try to, we try to make ourselves talk in a way that we think, oh, God's really going to like when I say that. He's really going to like to hear that. We just end up bored. Because it's fake and it's phony. And so today we're going to see how to pray, how we should pray and, and this is the Lord's Prayer, and it's a prayer that most of you probably have memorized, and some of you have said it repetitiously throughout life, and we're not here to criticize that, but we just want you to understand something this morning, that what we're about to look at is a method, not a manuscript. It's a method, not a manuscript. We just saw last week that Jesus got on people because he said it's not about you repeating things that you don't really mean. Okay, And so when we look at the Lord's Prayer, what we're encouraging is a method, not a manuscript. And if you can incorporate the Lord's Prayer in your life as a method of prayer and not a manuscript and really mean it, then by all, by all means, repeat it. And, and if that's something that helps you, then we're not here to discourage that at all. But what we want to help you understand is this. What's important is the method that Jesus talks about here and not the manuscript. And you can find where we're going to be on your phones or your tablets. In the Bible app, we're going to look at Matthew 6, starting verse 9. If you don't have the Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along on the screens as we continue where we left off last week. And this week we see how to pray from the words of Jesus on the heels of him telling people how not to pray that we looked at last week. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Understand the relationship dynamic that we enjoy with God. That God is not some distant deity who's who's not concerned with our lives. But God is an intimate figure in our lives who loves us and desires the best for us so that we can approach God as a child approaches their father. There are relational implications that Jesus starts out with in prayer, that this is a personal thing and it's a familiar thing and we approach a God who is a God who loves us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, hallowed, we're all like, hmm? You know, a lot of us know that because we've, we've memorized the Lord's Prayer. But what is this concept? What is this idea? Well, it, it really just means holy. It really just means holy. 
And so Jesus says, when you pray, understand that God is a good God who wants to be invested in your life. He's a personal God. He loves you as a vested interest in you. So start with that understanding and then also understand who you're speaking to. Understand who you're speaking to. That God, this, this meaning of hallowed, is holy. That God is set apart. That we should treat the name of God in a special way. And, and that's a question I just want us all to, to just inwardly ask ourselves right now is, do we treat the name of God in a special way? And in our society, it gets thrown around frequently, and, and we're all guilty of it. And, and some of us, we, we come up with, with other ways of doing it. But have we allowed this familiar aspect that we enjoy with God, that God is our Father, to allow us to get sidetracked in some regards from the holy nature of God's name as well? There is, there is meaning in a name, and we need to treat the name of God specially. And so we don't need to use it flippantly, and we don't need to throw it around. Yes, God is personal, and yes, we enjoy that personal relationship with God, but let's make sure that we don't get so familiar to the fact that, that we forget that there's something special about that name. I enjoy a personal relationship with, with my two sons, but if they look at me and they're like, hey, Brian, at this point in their life, I'm just going to be like, that doesn't work for me, guys. It just doesn't work for me. You're six and five right now, all right? Let's, let's go with dad. All right. Now, when they were little, they called me dad. Now, later on in their life, if they want to call me Brian, I, I don't think I'm going to care. That's fine. But right now, I'm like, that, that just doesn't fly with me. And, and let's just make sure that the familiar aspect that we enjoy with God isn't something that we allow to, to, just, to just cloud the fact that God is still holy and reserved and special. Why? Because there's, there's importance in a name. A name conveys something about you. It conveys who you are. And it, it does to this day. It does to this day. Your name determines a lot about you. When you go for a loan, what is that based upon? It's based upon a credit score, which is essentially your name. It's based upon a bank looking at whether or not you repay things on a timely manner, how much you've already taken. That's what they're doing. They're looking at your name. A name carries value, and it carries weight. And so when we pray, we have a personal God who loves us, but we also have a holy God who's, who's worthy of our respect and who's set apart from us. And then Jesus continues in verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That God's kingdom in his, in his will, we desperately desire more of God in our world. That we would see more of God on display. That we in a, in a world that so desperately needs love and hope and peace would see all of the benefits of God unleashed. That God's kingdom would come. That God would rule and reign in the hearts of us, yes, but that God would rule and reign in the hearts of all. So that we would see people set free from that which holds them back. That we would see peace intersect into situations where people feel hopeless and helpless. That there would be love that radiates. And that would be, that, that would be what is normative instead of what we see on display now where we are desperately in need of love. This yearning desire that there would be more of God on display. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. We need more of that in this world. We need more hope. We need more peace. We need more love, and we need it desperately, and we need it desperately on display. And that's what Jesus is saying when he prays, your kingdom come, and God, your will be done here on earth in the same way as it is in heaven. And yet recently, there's, there's been pushback on this idea. Anytime there's a tragedy, or somebody's been given horrific news. A, a common thing that people will say is, you're in my thoughts and prayers. And there's recently been a lot of pushback on that, is what good are thoughts and prayers? Thoughts and prayers don't change anything. When in reality, nothing can change things quicker than prayer. And so there's this, subtle there's this subtle attack that makes people think, oh, well, if you pray, you don't do anything, when in reality, nothing can change things quicker than prayer. And so Jesus, when he says, God, your kingdom come, your will be done, what he's saying is pray that there would be more of God on display. 
And never believe for a minute that your prayers don't matter. Never believe for a minute that it's an empty response to tell somebody that you're praying for them. Nothing can do more benefit. Don't believe it. God, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You want to know how I know that nothing can can accomplish more than prayers? Because I've seen it in my life. And we've seen it in yours. When we started this a few weeks ago, we encouraged, we encouraged you to utilize the, the email address prayer at lakeside-church.com. Prayer at lakeside-church.com. And so far, many of you have sent requests, and that, that address is going to be open from here on out. So it's not just something for this series, but we want to continue to encourage you to utilize that so that we can join with you in praying for things that you are praying about. But I, we also want you to share your stories of how God is working and to share those stories with us at that same address so we can see the answers to prayer. And here are just some of the answers to prayer that we've seen in the last two weeks. We have seen people who are starting treatment for addiction issues that, they have, that they've refused up until this point because God has changed their heart and opened a door in the last two weeks that for years they rejected. And in the last two weeks, God has moved and opened that door. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. We have seen people who have stepped up and they are now, they're now filling vital roles that we have here at Lakeside positions that we've had for a while that we needed people to step up and to volunteer and we've we've racked our brains and so we decided to try a novel concept to pray about it right and in the last two weeks we've seen people step up in key positions that we've tried for over a year to fill why because prayer works and it changes things we've seen people who have, who, who have had medical issues, that they've gone to their doctor and through, through the doctors and through surgery, as well as through medications, through some lifestyle changes, we've had multiple reports of medical breakthroughs and people whose medical situation has, have either been cured or who are doing much better. As a, and we're not saying that medicine's not important, but we're also saying that prayer is a vital component to this as well. And we're seeing people that have had medical breakthroughs as well. In the last, just in the last two weeks, we're excited about this. We've seen somebody who's struggling with a job situation, and that situation has cleared up in the last two weeks. Prayer changes things. It works. It's, it's not some magic thing that, and, and we're going to talk about this more, that everything we throw out to God, God just hands to us, and he answers to us if we just pray for it. But prayer matters and it works. And I want to thank you for those of you who are allowing us to pray with you and alongside of you and who are sharing your stories and continue to do so. Please send us your requests. There is no greater honor that we have than when we gather as a staff to pray with and for you. And continue to share the stories of how God's working in your life. Because we love to read them and we love to hear them and we love to praise God with you. So we want to pray with you when times are tough, when things are great. We want to pray with you in every situation and every season. It's part of being a community. We want to be invested in one another's lives. And one of the greatest ways we can do that is to pray for one another. Jesus continues, give us this day our daily bread. Meet our needs. This is a recognition of where everything comes from. This is a recognition of the goodness of God to meet our needs, to make sure that what we need is taken care of. Give us this day our daily bread. And Jesus continues in verse 12, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And this is an awareness an awareness of our weaknesses, an awareness that all of us possess them. And they look different for many of us than, than what they look like for someone else, but all of us possess weaknesses. And this is just a recognition of that fact. Forgive us our debts. We fall short. 
every single one of us. We fall short. We don't measure up. We make mistakes. We wrong people. Every single one of us is there. And this is an acknowledgement of our weakness and our imperfection. Forgive us our debts. So we start there. And notice how Jesus continues. As we also have forgiven our debtors. And so this is a prayer that forces us to be aware of what we struggle with. And yet also a prayer of strength. A prayer of strength that as we are aware of our own faults and our own shortcomings, that we can be strong enough to forgive those who have been weak and and forgive those who have committed offenses against us. Because in the same way, all of us are aware of our own weaknesses and and we are people who victimize other people, we can be victimized by others as well. Because of their weaknesses. Forgive us, God, for when we mess up. And let this idea of forgiveness incorporate and encompass every portion of us. So that we have strength to forgive those who wrong us. And lead us not into temptation deliver us from evil. Help us make the right choices in light of our weaknesses, in light of our faults, in light of, in light of all of those things. God, lead us not into temptation. Help us make the right choices. Sometimes that's incredibly easy, and sometimes that's incredibly hard. And if we're honest about it, there are things in our lives where we don't want to make the right choices. Because we know what the right choices are. And we'd rather not make them. And so this is the understanding that we have a choice to make. And we have to ask God for his help. Help us make the right choices. And deliver us. But deliver us from evil. Deliver. We can't defeat evil. We can't. We need God's help. And so Jesus says, when you're praying, pray for God to deliver you from evil. And that doesn't mean that we just throw in the towel and we don't try to fight it. But what it does mean is there has to be this understanding that we can't overcome evil in and of ourselves. We need the power of God at work in us and through us. And so God, please deliver us from evil. And then Jesus says this. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let me read that again. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So do you think forgiveness matters in the heart of God? Now, here's the question. If we can't do anything to earn God's favor, and we can't do anything to earn our salvation, and we can't, we see that throughout Scripture, it's by grace that we're saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, lest anyone can boast. It is a gift of God. What is this idea that Jesus talks about here? When he says, if you don't forgive somebody else, God isn't going to forgive you. Doesn't it seem like our forgiveness from God, who we ultimately sin against, and all the wrong is ultimately against God, doesn't it seem like he's holding out our forgiveness on something that we have to do? How can that be? Is our salvation dependent upon us doing something? What does Jesus mean? Once you've really understood the depth of the love of God for you, once you've really understood the depth of grace, The fact that none of us measure up to God's standard. And all of us fall short. 
and need a Savior. Once you really understand what Jesus did when He sacrificed Himself to die in our place, to lay down His life as a sacrifice for our shortcomings and our mistakes and our weaknesses and our faults and our sins, and once we fully comprehend just how great the love and grace of God is, it changes us at the core. To the point that as recipients of grace and forgiveness, we can't legitimately follow and love God and refuse to forgive someone who's wrong. Now, one of the problems that people have when we say that is what forgiveness entails. Forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. Forgiveness does not mean that somebody wrongs you and then you have to go forward as if it never happened. And so there has to be a proper understanding of what forgiveness really is. And what forgiveness really means is you acknowledge the hurt Someone is committed. And then rather than hurt them back, you let go and let God take over. Now, reconciliation is an entirely different process. And reconciliation is dependent upon forgiveness, but forgiveness is not dependent upon reconciliation. But once we've experienced the love and the grace and the depth of the magnitude of the goodness of God poured out on us, we as people who follow and love God can no longer refuse to forgive. It's not an option available to us. And that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But what it does mean is that God's expectation for us is not to wrong that person, but is to let go and let God deal with it. Our Father, personal, a God who loves you, and is invested in your life. Hallowed be your name. A holy God who deserves our awe and our respect. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, more of you on display. And how does that start in this world? By more of God on display in me. That people would see more and more of Jesus in me and less and less of me. Give us this day our daily bread. Acknowledgement of our need for God and just how much He pours out upon us. Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Awareness that we fall short. But God loves us anyways. And a plea for strength when others wrong us. And lead us not into temptation. That we would make the right choices even when we don't want to. But deliver us from evil. That God would rule and reign in our hearts and in our lives. This isn't a manuscript. It's a method. And 
That's what Jesus told us to do when we cry out to him. God, I pray that we would understand the depth of your love for us. I pray, God, that you would just reveal yourself to us in new ways. I pray for somebody here, God, who feels unloved, and they feel unlovable. And I pray, God, just through all the circumstances, you would just pierce their heart, even right now, this very second, and help them know how much you love them. God, I pray that we would see you for who you are, that you are holy and you are special, and you deserve our awe and our respect. That more of you would be on display in our lives. And as a result in this world. That we would thank you for all you do. To provide for our needs. And we never lose sight of where your gifts come from. God that you'd help us. As we acknowledge our faults. And you'd give us strength. To forgive those who've wronged us. That we would make wise choices and good decisions. That you would deliver us from the evil of this world. And you'd help us forgive. God, my prayer is that we would be people who engage you, that we would never believe the lie that prayer doesn't matter, that it's empty, that there's something more valuable. And God, that we would engage together as a community. We'd see you work for your glory. In your son Jesus' name we pray.